Is everybody ready for the Christmas season? A little bit, you think? Okay. Well, uh, we've been uh, talking about songs for Christmas, and that's been our theme for this uh, Christmas season, is we've been taking every week uh, a special Christmas song, and we've been kind of unraveling it, so to speak, and, and learning a little bit more about it. So um, I was thinking as I was putting this message together that, that uh, ever since before Thanksgiving, I started listening to some more Christmas music. Anybody else start before Thanksgiving? Yeah, yeah a couple of you? Yeah. And the thing I noticed was that as I really was listening closely and paying attention to the lyrics, I was learning a lot about some songs that I never knew the meaning of, like, you know, uh, all I want for Christmas is what, my two front teeth, right? And how about I want a hippopotamus for Christmas? I mean, who actually gets a hippopotamus, right? But, but when we think about the songs and the importance of them and we really understand the language of the lyrics of the songs, we find out some things that will really change our lives. So, so I started slowing down a little bit and thinking about some of these, some of these words. So today's uh, song is a really important one. And it actually was written originally by John Francis Wade. And he wrote it in, in Latin, not pig Latin, but regular Latin. And um, the title of the hymn or song is Adesta Fideles. And uh, I learned that song probably in grade school. Patty and I were, were talking about that yesterday, about how as little kids, we learned a song in Latin, and it was kind of cool. Well, in 1864, uh, that all changed when Frederick Oakley translated uh, Adeste Fideles into English. And it's a hymn or song that we've come to know really well. Do you know what it is? It's, Oh, Come All Ye Faithful. Right. You got it? Okay. So let's listen to this beautiful song.
the song's message, um, Oh Come All Ye Faithful, can be a little bit intimidating if you're not careful. I mean, I mean, think about it. Oh Come All Ye Faithful. Uh, Christmas is a season that, that we wanna say that we're faithful. We want to uh, talk about the things of faith. We wanna remind ourselves of the birth of Jesus and that Christ is coming again. But uh, if we're gonna be real about it, sometimes the Christmas season finds us everything but faithful. It finds us um, worrying about things. It finds us uh, overwhelmed. It finds us um, waiting for family to come over for dinner. I mean, you know, all those things that just build up the challenges that, that are before us. And we, we say to ourselves, you know, uh, this expectation that, that I'm supposed to come and I'm supposed to be faithful and, and think about that. You know, how do we do that? How do we come and how are we faithful? We can even find ourselves um, doubting our ability to be triumphant. I mean, what's, what's with the word triumphant? I mean, does anybody actually use the word, I'm triumphant today? I mean, do, is that part of our vocabulary? I mean, I, I was sitting there thinking about, okay, so, so we binge watched, um, you know, uh, How to Get Away with Murder, and, and I'm thinking, we're triumphant, we did that. And, or, or I got all my Christmas shopping done, which I haven't. I'm triumphant. And it's that word of, of being triumphant, and, and we learn that from this hymn. And, and, and again, it's, it's one of those things of what exactly does that mean? And then there's, it talks about joy, you know, come all ye faithful, joyful and triumphant. And I, I can be a pretty joyful guy until my wife comes to me and says, you wanna go grocery shopping? Boy, I tell you what, that turns it in a different direction, you know. And, and see, we have a different way of shopping, you know. Um, I'm kind of the bag and tag kind of guy. Anybody else like that in the, in the, in the congregation, yeah? And, and so, so if I get a list of by order item, by alphabetical, by aisle, by, you know, place in the shop and all that, and we can go in and bag and tag and get it done, I'm happy. But it doesn't work that way. We'll go into the grocery store, and, and I'm like pushing the, the buggy like, here, let's get this. Okay, this on the list is this. And Patty's look going and looking. Hmm. And she kind of looks at everything. And, and then all of a sudden, we get everything there. And if that's not, you know, something that pulls your nails out, we, we go, and she always picks the grocery checkout line that's impossible, right? You know, the one where you go, and somebody's like reaching in the coin purse trying to find the extra penny, to pay the cash register. And the person who writes a check, I mean, who writes a check today? Anybody? I mean, you just like, shh, the card. And then what I love is that, that line where you go and the person has 300 coupons to redeem. And it's like forever at the grocery store. I mean, who can be joyful? Who can be triumphant when all of these things are, are happening? But let's be serious for a second because it's not all funny, is it? I mean, sometimes in our lives that, um, our lives are real in a sense that we don't feel joyful. We don't feel triumphant. And what happens is, is that we get in those positions where, where something comes that just like rips the Band-Aid right off and it hurts and it exposes something that's there. But yet, God says, come and be triumphant. When I look at this um, song, I, I, the question that, that presses me is, is, who is it that Jesus is calling? Oh, come all ye faithful. Who is it that he's calling? Who are the persons that he's calling? Is, is he only calling the people who have life together? Is he only calling the, the over-faithful, the, the people that never do anything wrong, the, oh, the saints above, you know, the halos above their heads? What we really find out is that's not at all who Jesus calls, is it? In fact, Jesus calls quite the opposite, and it's not the people who have it all together. He actually calls the people who are weary and burdened. You know, weary and burdened, think about that for a second. If you are weary, if you are burdened, Jesus is calling you. Here's what he says, he says, come to me. Come to me all uh, who are weary and burdened and I will give you rest. And the second thing that we know that Jesus calls is Jesus calls the sinners. He calls the sinners. He doesn't just call the righteous, the goody goodies. He doesn't just call the people that make all the right decisions. He calls the sinners. It says, it's not the healthy, Jesus says, who need a doctor, but it's the sick. But go and, and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have not come to call the righteous, but I've come to call who? Sinners. He has come to call the sinners. So it's almost as if we could like rewrite this song and say, oh come all ye sinners, joyful or non-joyful and burden, oh come ye to Bethlehem. And yet this hymn has this huge meaning that has a, a focus for us. A lot of times when we think about where we are in life, we, we want to just kind of move through life in our own strength. 
And I've come to learn in my life that, that sometimes that doesn't always work. And what does work is, is when you come to that breaking point where something just snaps in your life, and then you just cry out, I need you, Lord Jesus, I need you, I come now. Not faithful, but, but maybe weary and burdened. I come as a sinner, and I come before you to Bethlehem. Listen to what the Apostle Paul writes. Paul says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old has gone, and the new, the new is here. See, God, God wants us to realize that, that we are a new creation. God wants us to realize that, that when we are in Christ, something gives, something changes. That the old life that we had is gone and the new life in Christ emerges and we then can help find ourselves moving in the right direction. So what is it that Jesus actually does? We know that he calls the weary, he calls the burden, he calls the sinners, but what does Jesus do? So, so his promise is not to leave us the way that we are, but to transform us into something new. So here's what we learn from Jesus. Jesus helps us to become more faithful. Say that word, faithful. He helps us to become more faithful. The writer of Hebrews says this, fix our eyes on Jesus, faith's pioneer and perfecter. Another translation is the author and perfecter of our faith. So whenever we're not sure about faith, we fix our eyes on Jesus because he's the one who's authored it for us. And he is the perfecter of it. And as we keep our eyes on the Christ, we see it leads us toward having a life that is more faithful. Faith comes from hearing, Paul says, and hearing through the word of Christ. So he says that the way that we find faith is not just in our own stories that we might share with each other, not just in corporate worship, but it comes in hearing the word of God. And then that when we hear the word of God, something changes within us, something transforms us, that we hear the truth that speaks in the midst of the darkness of what sometimes our life can offer. And Paul says that it's very important that the hearing through the word of Christ is what helps us to become a new person. Last week I, I, I shared with you, um, we had a couple years where August was really bad for us. I shared with you last week about August 2014 when Patty's dad had died. And, and I wanna back up a year from that to August 2013. So here's a little pattern here. And, and in thinking about you know, how the word of God helps us to become more faithful, how the word of God and how the life and the words of Christ build that foundation of our faith, uh, we were anticipating uh, the birth of, of our third grandchild, uh, baby Grace. And uh, we were all excited and our daughter was excited. This was her third child. And, and we were just you know, ecstatic and getting things in, in order so that when the baby was born, we could go and, and, and help out and, and, and be there to celebrate. And, and as we were uh, driving down to Orlando on the day of her birth, uh, midstream, we find out that she died during birth. And, and that was um, um, very crushing, to say the least. And um, a, lot of, a lot of time to get through, a lot of time to seek God, a lot of time to, to find answers. And I remember that as we were there at the hospital, we just decided, okay, we're, we're just gonna gather down in the hospital chapel. And I love it that hospitals have chapels. And I said, we're just gonna gather in the chapel. And, and so Patty and I are walking rather numbly down this long hallway. And, and it was one of those unique ones. It was just you know, all walls and no doors, no, no exits, anything. It was just this long hallway. And at the end of the hallway to the left was the chapel. And we're walking down there. And, and I guess I got ahead of her because you know, uh, I'm a guy and I wanna fix things and, and I wanna like, make it right. And I don't want her hurting. And, and it didn't matter how I was feeling, but I didn't want her hurting. I didn't want her daughter hurting. I didn't want the family hurting. So I thought if I get to the chapel first, then I can kind of make sure there's nobody in there and we can have it to ourselves and we can really pray and we can really meditate. And so I'm moving on to that. And, and Patty's just kind of walking forlorn down this long hallway. And from the opposite direction, coming toward her is a woman who's dressed in scrubs. And she passes just right up to Patty and Patty's looking down and she's just very distraught about what happened. And the, and the woman says, why are you looking down? And Patty says, well, you know, it's just, it's been a horrible day and some really bad things have happened and we're just not sure, you know, what, what's next. And the woman said, don't look down Look up, that's where God is. 
look up. So Patty didn't think anything about it. She just kept walking. And I guess as she was walking down this uh, long hallway, she thought, wow, that was really profound. And, and this woman who was a perfect stranger said something to me and brought it kind of back to, to that God piece. And so she turned to thank the woman and she was gone. Like, gone. And as we thought about this a little bit, we, we realized that there are angels amongst us. And there are angels amongst us in those instances when, when we are at that really low place and when we don't feel like coming all faithful and joyful and triumphant, that, that God has a way through the word to make things new again. The prophet Isaiah writes this, says, when you pass through the waters, I'll be with you. When you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, and folks, we were, we were walking through the fire, you will not be burned. I mean, listen to these words. The flames will not set you ablaze, for I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. God's word speaking to us, reminding us that in the midst of the, the challenges of what life can bring, that God never leaves. That anchor that's there. And, 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 and through this woman that walked in the hallway, you know, Patty, Patty was able to hear those words of, of Isaiah. When you pass through the waters, I'll be with you. When you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you'll not be burned. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. Through his word, Jesus helps us to know that we can find a way to come faithful, joyful, and triumphant. Here's another thing we find out. Jesus helps us to become more joyful, okay? In Galatians 5, Paul, Paul writes about the fruit of the Spirit. And Paul says that, that when we have the fruit of the Spirit, it's not fruits, plural, it's fruit. It's all of those things as fruit. It's one thing. It's, it's peace and, and love. It's all those things. Compassion, it's all of those things. And, and Paul says that, that we have that in us and, and God places that fruit in every single person. And when we become believers, we recognize the importance of what the Holy Spirit is doing in our life. And we then enact upon those gifts, those, that fruit that God has placed within us. But, but it's kind of like this, you know, if you have an apple tree, um, an apple tree can't produce a pepperoni pizza, can it? It can't produce a big burrito or anything like that. What does it produce? It produces apples. So, so an apple tree is created for one thing, produce apples. You and I were created for one thing, to produce the fruit of God and to have that fruit of the Spirit within us. And joy is a fruit that, of the Spirit that God has placed in us. And that's why it's so important for us to understand that, that, that being joyful and being happy are two different things. Happiness can change on a dime. Happiness can change when you step on a scale, you're no longer happy, some of us. Happiness can change when you get a doctor's report and your triglycerides are too high, I'm not talking about myself. But, but, but you know, we, we find out that happiness can change anything in a heartbeat. But joy, joy, joy is what comes from God. And it cannot be taken from us. It is a fruit of the Spirit. And Jesus promises that fruit is upon us. See, happiness depends upon happenings, and joy depends on Jesus. When we look at the Christmas story in, in Luke's gospel, uh, we, we find this uh, great story of the angels there amongst the shepherds. And I, and, and I love the story of Christmas because it so reminds us that, that, that um, the story of God is not just for the people who can afford it. The story of God is not for the most educated. The story of God isn't for the people who have all the stuff or whatever, or the best job or the, you know, whatever. But the angels appear first to the lowliest of all, shepherds the outcasts of society, they were so low on the totem pole that they weren't even allowed to live in the villages because they were too poor and, and, and nobody wanted to be around these shepherds. And yet they were the ones that God appears to first. And the angel of the Lord comes and appears in this joyful moment. Here's what it says. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, the shepherds, and the glory of the Lord shone around them and they were terrified but the angel said to them, do not be afraid. 
I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. For today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah. He's the Lord. I mean, think about this for a second. A Savior has been born. Is that not joyful? A Savior has been born for you. Is that not something that we should be triumphant about? A Savior has been born. Doesn't it make sense of all these things, of the importance of who Christ is? So, so he, also, he also says to be faithful, joyful, and he says Jesus can make us triumphant. So believe it or not, our faith in Christ can make us triumphant. We need someone who can have our back. I mean, do, do you know anybody that, that um, kind of walks through life and, and is constantly looking over their shoulder because they're afraid someone's after them? Have you ever been in a situation where you thought, man, if somebody just had my back on this, then the whole equation would change and things would be different. You know, God has our back and we need to be aware of that, 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 that God stands triumphant behind us and God is that immovable rock that nobody can push away or cast aside, but that God is, is there. God is triumphant. We realize that someone has our back and, and, and the person that has our back is the Lord. And that's how we can come as the faithful. That's how we can come joyful. That's how we can be triumphant. In the midst of our brokenness, in, a, in the midst of our imperfections, we can be all of these things through Christ, who is our strength. Listen to what um, Isaiah writes here. He says, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called, listen to these words, wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, the prince of peace, all nicknames, all names, many of the names of God. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. Forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. I mean, this is where we've got to get it right because Two weeks ago, I talked about the manger scene and all of that stuff and, and how often we, we, we just want to think about, you know, the, the seven-pound baby Jesus kind of thing. And, oh, baby Jesus. And we want to kind of, we channel Ricky Bobby into that. And we, oh, baby Jesus. And we, we want that. But that's not what it is. I mean, think about it. it. It's not about a baby wrapped in claws. He's the king of kings. He's the Lord of lords. He's the alpha, the omega. He is the beginning of the end. He is the first and he is the last. He holds the keys of life and death. He is the bread of life. He is the prince of peace, the almighty father, the everlasting God. He is Christ the Lord. That's why we come all faithful. You know, it's not just an invitation to Bethlehem. It's not just an invitation to, to think about what it meant thousands of years ago. The invitation today, O come all ye faithful, joyful and triumphant, O come ye, O come ye to Largo, Florida, to Clearwater, to wherever you may be worshiping with us today. And it's when we come that we can bow down and we can behold him, for he is Christ the Lord.